Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for uh, putting on such an amazing uh, symposium and uh, giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you in, in long form. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, basically uh, uh, the fields of uh, collective intelligence in unconventional spaces. And if anybody would like to get in touch with me afterwards, all of the primary papers, the software, everything else is, is, is here. So I want to start by uh, just uh, showing one of, my, um, one of my heroes, Alan Turing. We all know that he was a forefather of artificial intelligence. He was very interested in uh, this idea of, of, of creating uh, cognitive systems and, and various kinds of intelligence. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is well known. What's maybe less well known is that the same person was really interested in morphogenesis. He wrote uh, one of the very early uh, papers on, uh, on trying to understand self-organizing uh, chemical systems. And you might wonder why it is that the same person would be interested in intelligence and morphogenesis. And I think that uh, he saw a very deep uh, parallel between these two, uh, these, these two areas of study. And I think he was right on the money in the sense that um, I think these are actually very much the same question. Now, most of the time when we think of intelligence, we think of something like this. So here's a brain and we think of, okay, here's a, here's a what quote unquote centralized intelligence of some, some animal. Um, and then we look at things like this, ant colonies and so on. And sometimes we talk about them as uh, distributed or collective intelligence, a swarm cognition and so on. You know, Ricard Soleil calls them liquid brains. But actually it's, it's important to realize that this is just a matter of scale because if one zooms in, you find out that we are all, in fact, collective intelligences, and we are all made of something like this. So this is a single cell. This is a lacrimaria. It has no brain. It has no nervous system. It has no cell-to-cell -cell, uh, communications or stem cells or any of the things that we're used to having in bodies. And what it what it does is it handles all of its local needs, so, so morphological, uh, behavioral, metabolic, and so on, at the single cell level very competently. And the amazing thing about this is that we all have taken the same uh, journey from, uh, from um, what, what might be called just physics, which is an oocyte, right? A, a, set of, uh, uh, a set of chemical reactions that people would look at and would think, okay, this, this has no cognitive capacity. This is just, just some physics and chemistry. And yet uh, slowly, so over a matter of some months and, and maybe years, this process gives rise to these amazing morphologies and in fact to high level human cognition that has second order you know metacognition and self awareness and so on and so this is a journey across the cartesian cut that we all take if you follow your own uh, your own development back far enough you will find this and before that you will find just so it's quote unquote just physics so it's really interesting to to ask how how this transition works this this smooth transition and so the main points that i'm going to try to transmit today are these First, that uh, biology uses a kind of multi-scale competency architecture of nested problem solvers, and that navigation is a really central concept to try to understand. Navigation of spaces in particular is a central concept to try to understand this. Um, I'm gonna claim that uh, goal directedness is a, is a critical invariant for recognizing, building, and uh, uh, relating to various unconventional agents. And I'll describe a kind of cognitive boundary model for the scaling of goals. I'm going to uh, spend about half the talk showing you one specific example in detail, which is this idea that uh, pattern formation, biological pattern formation, is literally the behavior of a collective intelligence of cells in a space known as morphospace. And uh, I'm going to show you that bioelectrical networks are the uh, protocognitive medium, the ancestor of, of brain function. And uh, this, this idea actually has some very uh, practical um, impacts on biomedicine. This is not just a sort of philosophy, this has very specific applications. And in the end, I'm going to show you how uh, synthetic bioengineering provides a really astronomically large option space for new bodies and new minds that don't have standard evolutionary backstories. So we'll get to that towards the end. So uh, single cells have some really uh, interesting spatial competencies that we can start off by thinking about. So this is a diatom, this is a single cell, and that particular, very particular structure is something that it can reliably uh, acquire. This is a collection of uh, several uh, acetabularia algae. Each one of these things is in fact a single cell. It has one nucleus, the whole thing is maybe uh, you know, six or seven centimeters long. It has some roots, it has a stalk, it has a cap here. The whole thing is just one cell. And so this is quite interesting to ask how it is that a single cell can have such 
such profound morphological differentiation. But these, uh, these competencies are not only spatial, they are also uh, behavioral. And so what you're seeing here is a slime mold. This is a Physarum polycephalum. It is, uh, the whole thing is one cell. It can, be quite, it can grow to be very large, but the whole thing is one cell. And so when you place it in the middle of this, this Petri dish, the little white circles are glass disks. There's, nothing, there's no food, there's no chemicals. They're completely inert glass. So what it will do as it grows during the first few hours, it sort of grows evenly outward like this. And what it's doing during this time is sending out vibrations into the medium. It pulses and sends vibrations into the medium reading back the vibrations that that return so it's almost a kind of sonar it's sensing uh sensing the properties of the medium and by doing this it can actually build a map of its environment and then reliably make its way over to the heavier mass so it can reliably detect three discs over one and you can do all sorts of fun experiments of stacking them one on top of each other and distributing them but it has an amazing ability to sense the mass in its vicinity and to make both morphogenetic and behavioral decisions based on that information. Okay, so so you can you can see this this cell navigating in this in this space according to the to the biomechanical information that it has. So I'm going to uh, tr show you uh, four basic things today. So so first I'm going to um, try to uh, uh, introduce some some biology that you may or may not have seen before, uh, designed to really uh, kind of stretch our idea of what is an organism, what is a mind, what does it mean to navigate space, and so on, and then. Then we'll get into this very specific examples of bioelectricity and morphogenesis, and then uh, we'll talk about some of these uh, novel organisms. So uh, the kind of the traditional view is is of these um, discrete static natural kinds. You have a particular animal, maybe you have a rat that you're studying in a maze, or a human subject, or whatever you have, and that's you know that's kind of that's kind of your unit. But I wanna I wanna go beyond this this sort of Garden of Eden view and really emphasize that agents that do these intelligent things are incredibly plastic. So here's one familiar example. Here we start with a caterpillar. This is a creature that lives in a, in a largely two-dimensional world. It crawls around on flat surfaces, it chews leaves, and it has a brain appropriate for that purpose. It has to turn into a butterfly, which is going to live in a very much a three-dimensional world. It has to fly, it has to drink nectar, uh, and, uh, in, and it needs a completely different brain. This is a soft-bodied robot. This is a hard-bodied, uh, you know, needs a, a controller suitable for hard uh, kinds of bodies. And so in between, what happens is during this process, the brain is largely, uh, largely um, destroyed. Most of the connections are broken down. Most of the cells die. And, and the new brain is rebuilt during the lifetime of the organism. So, you know, this, 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 this kind of change makes uh, the, the confusion of uh, puberty seem like um, real child's play, you know, in the sense that this is a single agent radically changing its, its, its brain and its body. And the amazing thing about it is that uh, memories that the caterpillar acquires are retained in the moth or butterfly. So this has been shown. So despite the, despite the uh, disaggregation of the brain, actually some information is able to make it across. In fact, this can be even more radical. These are, these are planaria. These are flatworms, and you'll see a lot more about them in this talk. The planaria regenerate any part of their body, so you cut them into pieces. Uh, the record is something like 275 pieces. Each piece regrows exactly what's missing, including the brain, and you get perfect little worms. So um, James McConnell back in the 60s made an observation, and uh, it was um, uh, you know quite controversial at the time, but we repeated it and, and actually discovered he was, he was absolutely right. Uh, what happens is that if you if you train these planaria to recognize a particular region of their environment, let's say one with these little little bumps laser etched into it as the place where they get fed, you can then amputate the head and the brain. I mean, these animals have a true centralized brain. Amputate the head and the brain, leave the tail. The tail sits there for eight or nine days doing pretty much nothing. Eventually, it grows a new, a fresh brain. And somehow that information is imprinted onto this new brain, and these animals show uh, show retention of that of that memory. So the information moving through the body, being imprinted from from one tissue onto another, is something that uh, we we really need to start to understand. And in fact, uh, beyond uh, beyond those kind of experiments, you can do this in vertebrates. We did this in a tadpole. So this is a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. Um, here's the brain. Here are the nostrils. Here's the mouth, the gut, and the tail. One thing you'll notice is that what we've done is we've prevented the normal eyes from forming. We've put an ectopic eye on the tail. So this is, a, this is an eye that forms on the tail. And the amazing thing about these animals is that with no long, in fact, with no period of evolutionary adaptation to this new configuration, they can see perfectly well out of these eyes. So we've made a device that tests them on visual training cues. 
and sort of automate. It's the same thing we use to test the planarian memory. It's an automated behavior uh, testing device. And what we found is that this eye finds itself in a completely novel environment surrounding my muscle instead of near the brain, puts out an optic nerve. That optic nerve might connect to the spinal cord. It does not go up to the brain. The brain that evolved for tracking visual data from these two locations suddenly gets information from some weird itchy patch of tissue on its tail. No problem. It recognizes that as visual data and these animals behave quite well in, uh, in learning assays. So, so navigating, um, navigating your world with uh, a radically different um, configuration of sensory and, uh, and processing organs. So what we really see in biology is that not only are we nested dolls structurally, I mean, we all, everyone knows that groups consist of individuals made of organs, tissues, cells, and so on, but actually each one of these levels has competency. It solves problems in its own space, and there are lots of different kinds of spaces. And that multi-scale architecture, uh, which is uh, which is kind of unique. It's something that um, in uh, in engineering we're still really not not able to uh, re re recapitulate, although we're getting there. Uh, shows competency in many many different spaces. Now now the one thing I'd like to I'd like to do fundamentally is to uh, generalize this idea of being able to perform intelligently in some space. So typically we oh, no. think about, typically we think about three dimensional oh, okay. spaces. So. Uh, behavior moving the body in three-dimensional space. So it's very easy for us to, to, to recognize intelligence in those spaces because all of our sense organs point outward. And from the time you were very little, you were collecting data on object, medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds around you in three-dimensional space. And, and we know how to recognize you know, birds and, and uh, mammals and other things be behaving intelligent. But what we don't have are senses that directly show us. For example, imagine that you, had a, you were born with a sense that where you could actually feel your blood chemistry, all the different things going on in your blood physiology, and all of the things that your liver, pancreas, and other organs were doing. In that case, we would have a training set that would allow us to understand intelligent navigation of other spaces. So that would be physiological space, so the space of physiological parameters. Um, it might be a transcriptional space, so the space of gene expression, all the different gene expression domains, or in fact, morphospace, the, the, the space of all possible anatomical configurations. We'll talk more about that. I want to show you, um, and, and, and this, this, the, 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 the fact that we're not uh, familiar with these other spaces means that when we make uh, claims about the cognitive level or the intelligence level of other systems, we're really taking an IQ test ourselves. What we're really saying is this is what we've recognized the system to be doing, but we can't really assume that, uh, that we're smart enough to know exactly what it's doing and what it's solving in, in all of the different spaces. I want to show you a simple example. Again, these are, plen these are the planaria, and what we found is that if we put planaria into a, uh, a solution of barium chloride, so barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker. It prevents these cells from uh, exchanging potassium with the outside world. So when you do this, literally their heads explode. Okay, their heads just psh, overnight, they, they blow up. But the amazing thing is that if you keep the rest of the worm in barium, over the next couple of weeks, they regenerate, they grow a brand new head, and the new head does not care about barium whatsoever. The new head is barium adapted. Now that's kind of amazing. And so we asked a simple question. We just looked at the transcriptomes of, of naive worms versus barium adapted heads. And we just asked, well, what gene expression is different? Okay, what's different about these barium adapted heads? And one thing we found is that th there's only a handful of genes. There's less than a dozen genes that are in fact different. And so this, this uh, system is able to figure out which genes to up and down regulate so that it can do its business without being able to pass potassium properly. But the incredible thing about this is that barium is not anything that planaria ever see in the wild. This is completely uh, a completely unnatural novel stressor. So, so it's implausible to think that at some point there was evolutionary pressure to develop a response to barium. So what you're really talking about here is you're in the, you're in the space of gene expression, which is, you know, let's say if they have 20,000 genes, it's a, it's a massively, um, you know, a very high dimensional space. And you need to walk in that space to find the, the exact uh, genes that are going to solve your physiological stressor. Now, you don't have time to sort of randomly f flip genes on and off, first of all, because it'll, it'll most likely kill you before you find the good concentrate the, the good combinations also also there's no there's no time for that these cells don't turn over that fast it's not like a bacterial um, evolutionary system so it's still very much an open question how how do they navigate this this transcriptional space to to solve these kinds of solve these kinds of problems so 
this 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 to me is 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 very much an example of of, of intelligence in the sense of uh, problem solving, taking what you already might know. Maybe there's information about what to do in a case of epileptic seizures or so on, and bringing it to a new a new scenario. And so so I've been working on this on this framework. Uh, it's called TAME, TAME for it stands for Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. And the goal of this framework is to be able to uh, recognize, uh, create, and relate to truly diverse intelligences. So we need to handle, of course, the things we're familiar with, birds, uh, primates, and so on, but also weird colonial organisms and swarms and things like that. Um, of course, all the new things that are being produced by synthetic morphology and synthetic biology approaches and possible exobiological agents, because studying uh, just the natural um, systems that are, that, are, that are here on Earth and, and making conclusions about biology from them is a little bit like testing your, your theory on the same data set that, that, that created it, right? It's all just an N of one uh, pass through, um, through phylogenetic space. So, so I, I tend to think about all kinds of unconventional, uh, different, different types of embodiments, whether they be evolved, designed, whatever, and really think about this kind of, this is a scale by uh, Rosenbluth, uh, Wiener, and Bigelow, looking at all the different kinds of behaviors that one might have in one space. Notice that it says nothing about what it's made of. It doesn't, doesn't say anything about having brains or being a specific kind of organism or scale temporally or whatever. It's, it's, all, it's all very functional. So this is, this, is, this is how we think about things in my group. And the key to this framework is that it has to uh, move experimental work forward. It has to enable new capabilities. And um, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how that happens. But first, let's just think about uh, this, this one particular kind of intelligence, which I think is, is super interesting, um, anatomical uh, control. As a uh, as a collective intelligence, first of all, um, notice the basic thing that needs explaining, which is that we all start life as a collection of embryonic blastomeres, and these this this is a cross section through a human torso. So this is what uh, what each of us has inside. Now look at all the, in, the incredibly complex and variant order, all the all the tissues and structures. Everything is in the right place next to each other, the right orientation, size, and so on. So the first question is, where is the shape encoded? How do, how, how do these cells know to make exactly this? And you might be tempted to say DNA and, and genomes, but we can read genomes now. And what we see is that genomes directly code for protein structure. So the genome specifies the micro level hardware that's present in every cell. But uh, there's nothing directly that you can read out in the genome about the symmetry type of the organism, the size, the shape, how regenerative it's going to be. Um, this is very much an open problem of how cells know what to what to make and when to stop. Uh, as workers in regenerative medicine, if parts of this are missing, we'd like to know how to signal the cells to rebuild, to do it again. And as engineers, we'd like to know, well, what else is possible, right? Given the exact same genome, what else can we ask these cells to do? Or is this the only thing they could possibly do? And you can, you can sort of uh, visualize forward the end game of this whole field is something like this. It would be an anatomical compiler where you should be able to sit down and draw at the level of anatomy, the animal or plant that you want, okay, not, not, the, not the pathways, not genes, but, but the actual anatomy. And uh, if we knew what we were doing, we would have a system that, um, deco that, that compiled that description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build this particular thing, in, in this case, a nice three-headed uh, planarian. Now, we don't have anything remotely like this. This is a very long, uh, long-term goal. And the reason that uh, it's really important is because if you think about it, um, pretty much every problem of biomedicine with the exception of infectious disease. So birth defects, uh, tra traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things boil down to one problem. How do you convince cells to build the exact structure that you want? If we solve that problem, all of this goes away. We'd be able to fix birth defects, regenerate limbs, reprogram tumors, all of this would, would, would go away. But it's a major, major problem. Why do we not have a, an anatomical compiler yet? So I want to be clear that um, despite the incredible progress in uh, genetics and molecular biology, we face very fundamental questions that have to do with not, not with the molecular mechanisms, but with the decision making. So here's a simple example. Um, here is, this is a baby axolotl. So axolotls are Mexican salamander. There's a baby axolotl and um, baby axolotls have legs. Here's a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. Tadpoles do not have legs. So now in my group, we make something called a frogolotl. So this is a half, it is a, it's a chimera, half uh, axolotl, half frog. You can mix the, the cells, they, they cooperate with each other just fine. They make something, a frogolotl. Now I ask a simple question. You've got the genome to the axolotl, you've got the genome to the frog. How come we don't have any models that tell us whether frogolotls will have legs? 
We have no idea from, from that information whether frog axolotls are going to have legs or not. And if they do have legs, whether those legs will be made of axolotl cells or also include frog cells. We, we, we have no idea, even though you've got the genetic information. So it's really important to start to understand the algorithms because where, um, where biomedicine is right now is that uh, we're very good at manipulating molecules and cells and getting information like this, which, uh, which gene and protein talk to which other uh, gene and protein. We are a long way away from actually controlling a large scale form and function. And in fact, you, you can think about the, the kind of parallel journey that uh, the computer science took. This is what programming looked like in the 40s and 50s, where in order to control the system, you had to physically rewire it, right? You were pulling wires in and out, you had to rewire it. Nowadays, uh, for a joke, I say to all my students, you know, you're on your laptop, you're going to go from, from uh, Microsoft Word to Photoshop, I want you to get out your soldering iron and start rewiring, you know, start rewiring. And of course, they all laugh because, because nowadays, we don't need to do that. We understand that if your hardware is good enough, it's reprogrammable with stimuli, with inputs, with experiences, not rewiring. But of course, modern molecular medicine is all about the hardware. We're all, we're all very excited about genomic editing and protein pathways and single molecule approaches. And so I think the reason that we are still roughly where computer science was in the, in the 50s is because we are, we've been neglecting one important um, aspect, and that is uh, multi-scale intelligence in biology. Now, what do I mean by intelligence? I mean uh, what William James meant, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And when, uh, when we talk about a, a pattern and anatomy, when I talk about goals, I mean regions of morphospace. Now, what's morphospace? Morphospace uh, is the, uh, the space of all possible configurations of some particular structure. So if you're looking at uh, snail shells, for example, there are three parameters that you can define. And uh, every shell is, every, every possible snail shell is some point within this morphospace. Okay. And this is, this is uh, an idea that's very, that's very old. In fact, Darcy Thompson in the 40s had this interesting uh, example in his, in his book on growth and form, where he noticed that if you just deform uh, certain animal shapes placed on a grid, you apply specific deformations to the grid, what you get are other, other species that do exist. Now, at the time, there was no molecular um, uh, mechanism, of course, known. There was not, nothing really, you know, really known about this. But I think, I think now we can, we can, we can do some, some very interesting things with this idea. So uh, navigating these spaces, changing your body shape to move from one region to another is not uh, trivial because there may be local minima, there may be barriers, there may be all kinds of things. So that, that's the task that we face as, as, uh, as morphogenetic agents. Now, embryogenesis is, is very good at this. They're, they're ex it's extremely reliable. So you start off in, uh, as, 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 this, uh, you know, as this kind of pattern, and eventually you end up here. And that's, that's generally very low, very low error. Um, but we can already see, actually, that, that this process is not simply a kind of pre-programmed, hardwired walk in morphospace, because we can deviate in the, in the middle. So, for example, we can take this nice uh, human embryo, divide it in half, literally cut it in half, and what you get are not two half organisms. You get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. This, this is where twins come from. And so this is a regenerative event where each, each half of this embryo basically realizes that it's actually not where it's supposed to be in morphospace. Uh, and, uh, and it needs to regenerate the other half in order to make the correct changes to get to its goal and where it needs to go. So this is not just embryonic. Uh, for example, back to this, this, um, this salamander, this, um, this axolotl, um, these guys regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, their spinal cords, uh, portions of their heart and brain, um, their ovaries. They're incredibly regenerative uh, as adults. And what happens is that uh, you can amputate, uh, for example, this limb at different positions. No matter where you cut, the cells will very quickly grow. They will grow exactly what's needed to make a normal axolotl limb, and then they stop. So this is a kind of example of anatomical homeostasis. They will continue working from wherever starting position until they get to the, uh, until they get to where they're going. Uh, parenthetically, this is not just for, 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 um, for frogs and uh, for, you know, axolotls and, and worms. Um, the human liver, of course, is regenerative. Even the ancient Greeks knew that. I have no idea how they knew that, but, but it seems like they did. Um, deer uh, every year regenerate massive amounts of, of bone, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day, uh, bone vasculature innervation skin. And um, even human children uh, below a certain age can regenerate their fingertips. If you just leave it alone, it will basically regrow cosmetically a very, very nice um, outcome. So we have, we have some, some ability to, uh, to, to improve our, our position in, in morphospace. One of the most amazing things about it is that as, as, a, as a body, as a, as a living creature, you can't count on your environment. 
you can't count on, in other words, you can't count on the environment being the same as it was before. You can't count on not being perturbed during the developmental process, maybe physiologically, maybe metabolically, maybe um, with a parasite or a teratogen. So you can't count on that and you still need to get your job done. In fact, you can't even count on your own parts being what you expected them to be. Now, uh, we, of course, uh, we, we don't have any machines that can do this, that can, that can repair themselves after damage or put themselves together with diverse parts. Here, this is, this is one of my uh, favorite examples of all time. This is a, a cross-section through a newt um, uh, kidney tubule. So, so here's the lumen of the tubule, and these are, these are the cells that make up the tubule. Normally, it's, uh, let's say, around eight cells that work together to form this kind of tubule. But one thing you can do is you can, you can, make, uh, you can uh, make these cells what's called polyploid, which means they have extra uh, genetic material. Amazing thing number one, with the ex excess genetic material, you still get a perfectly normal newt, no problem that there are all kinds of extra um, in information around, and no, no, no problem. But what does happen is that the cells get much bigger. And as the cells get physically bigger, fewer of them are needed to make the exact same shape lumen. Now, that's, that, that, that's amazing thing number two, is that these cells, the number of these cells will actually scale to their correct size so that you, all, you get the same out, final outcome with different numbers of cells. But the most amazing thing is that when you make these cells absolutely gigantic so that only one cell is big enough to make the whole lumen, what it will do is it will no longer cooperate with other cells. One cell will bend around itself making uh, the, the exact same lumen, okay? Now, the incredible thing about that is this is a different molecular mechanism. This was cell-to-cell -cell communication. This is cytoskeletal bending. And so what happens is that this is a kind of, uh, kind of top-down <clears throat> kind of top causation where in service of a large-scale anatomical spec, meaning having the correct lumen, you can call up different molecular mechanisms to get the job done. So this, again, is sticking with this, this theme of intelligence as the ability to uh, uh, handle novelty in terms of getting to where you're going from diverse starting positions uh, with perturbations, both external and internal, you know, your own parts are getting, are changing. Can you still do what you need to do? And all of this is, is described in, in, in some of these papers. Uh, and then, and then the final thing is that your, your walk through morphous space doesn't even have to be the same path. So here, for example, here's a, here's a frog. Frogs normally do not regenerate their legs. As I'll tell you momentarily, we have figured out a way to make them regenerate their legs. And when they do, so this is a pretty good uh, frog leg regeneration. You can see here, it's got, the, it's got the toes, the toenails, the webbing. I mean, everything's good. But in fact, the way it got here is not at all how frogs normally regenerate their limbs. Uh, the normally develop their limbs. So normal frog limb morphogenesis is here. You make these things and then you sort of make that, uh, you, you kill off the cells in the middle to make the, pa the paddle. This, is, this grows in a completely different way. You've got, the, you've got the middle, this kind of middle stalk here with a toenail, and then the toes sort of come off to the side. It looks much more like a plant. So it, it takes a different path through morphospace, space, but it ends up in the same place. So all of this, all of this is, is, uh, is, is back to illustrating some of these amazing uh, abilities of, of the cells to, um, uh, to, 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 to navigate. And so one very kind of uh, very, very uh, canonical example of this that we discovered a few years ago is, is this. So here's a tadpole. Here's the gut, the brain, the nostrils, and the eyes here. This tadpole needs to become a frog. In order to, for a tadpole face to be a frog face, things have to move. So the jaws have to move, the eyes have to move forward, um, everything has to move. And it used to be thought that this process was hardwired because if you're a standard tadpole and you want to be a standard frog, all you have to remember is which direction and by how much every piece of the face moves. What we did to, and, and, and we suspected that there was more intelligence to this process than that. And so we did an experiment. We, we created so-called Picasso frogs. And so these are tadpoles in which everything is messed up. The eyes on the side of the head, the jaws are off to the side, and the nostrils are, are too far back. I mean, everything is in the wrong position. And we found that these animals still largely make pretty normal frogs because all of these pieces will move in novel paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and have to double back to give you a normal frog face. So what the genetics gives you is not some hardwired system that always moves in the same way. What it specifies is a really interesting error minimization machine that uh, however you start it off with obviously with some limits, uh, we'll try to minimize the error and get to the correct final shape. Now, if we had a robotic swarm, uh, a collection of robots that was able to do this, we would, we would call this a prize-winning example of collective intelligence. We, we don't have such a, such a technology yet. So, uh, so, so we, we started trying to understand this process. How, how does all this work? And so to the standard 
feed forward kind of open loop process of developmental biology that that you that you would read about in in in, um, in class where there are genes they make proteins there's the, the, the some uh, the proteins interact via some physics and chemistry and then there's this emergent outcome we add to this these feedback loops whereby this is actually a homeostatic system if that if that uh, anatomy is disrupted in some way by injury by by um by injury, by mutations, by uh, teratogens, by parasites, whatever, then these feedback loops will kick in to try to minimize error. The cells will do what they can to try to get back to the correct shape. It's a thing, think about your thermostat. It's a basic homeostatic circuit. Now, on the one hand, this is uh, pretty, pretty expected. Biologists know all about feedback loops um, and, and so on. On the other hand, there's, there, are, there are two kinds of weird, weird uh, and unusual things here. The first is that every homeostatic process has to have a set point. So if you're going to try to uh, get back to uh, uh, where you need to be, you have to remember where the right uh, the, where the right position is. So you have to store a set point. We're used to thinking about scalars, single numbers as set points, so temperature, pH, things like that. Uh, but in this case, the set point is a some sort of a large scale uh, uh, geometry. It's a it's a descriptor of uh, some some kind of coarse grained descriptor of an anatomy. So it's a complex data structure. And in general, you know, biologists don't love to think about uh, goal-directed processes. The idea is there's supposed to be emergence and, and uh, kind of emergent uh, complexity. But this idea that things are working towards a goal, the way that any navigational system fundamentally does, is really not something that is, uh, is very comfortable, certainly for, for molecular biology. So how would something like this, how would something like this work? How could we have a navigating uh, system that, that uh, can, uh, can have goals in anatomical space. And so here's where we start to think about bioelectricity because our best example of a, a, a mechanism that allows us to navigate space towards goals is uh, the brain. And in the brain, uh, we know roughly what the architecture looks like. There are cells that uh, communicate with other cells in networks. These cells have ion channels. So these are little proteins that uh, help set a voltage to the cell and that voltage may or may not be communicated to its neighbors through these little gap junctions these are like um like electrical synapses that allow electrical information to pass back and forth and so so that's the hardware of the brain and what that hardware enables is a kind of software that among other things navigates spaces so here's a zebrafish this is a movie uh, taken by, uh, by, by this group uh, here that shows all the electrical activity in the living zebrafish brain. And so the commitment of neuroscience is that if we understood how to decode this information, we would be able to know what the cognitive content of this, of this brain was. So, so the, the memories, the preferences, the goals, whatever else the system was going to do, we should be able to decode it. So this is, this is that cycle that's called the neural, neural decoding, right? We should be able to understand what, what all these patterns mean. Well, it turns out that uh, this is not just for brains. This is an extremely ancient system. Um, all the cells in your body have ion channels. Most cells have gap junctions with each other. And what we might be able to do is just like neuroscientists, we might be able to extend this whole scheme to ask what are your tissues thinking about at any point in time, specifically to read the electrical. So this is a, this is a time lapse of an early frog embryo. Uh, the colors are a fluorescent dye reporting voltage the same way that we did here, that um, it was done here with these, uh, with these zebrafish. Uh, and uh, you, we might be able to decode this information to ask what are the targets in anatomical amorphous space? What is this thing going to build? And so there's this, there's this amazing uh, isomorphism between the story of the brain, where you've got, you've got the, the hardware and the software, and there's various experiences and various other ways that this software gets mo modified. Um, the hardware basically only just gets built by, uh, in, in development. And what, what the brain does is it controls muscles to move your body in three-dimensional space. Now that's a pretty cool trick. Where did it learn this trick? Well, evolutionarily, this is exactly the same as something that was going on long before brains appeared, which is this exact same system, but it used to be for moving the body configuration in morphous space. Before there were nerves and muscles, um, cells needed to talk to each other and process information to get around in uh, morphous space. And so uh, um, I, we, we've argued uh, in, this, in this paper that basically uh, uh, neural, neural electricity is just an evolutionary pivot across spaces from morphous space to three-dimensional space of a very, uh, very ancient system for processing information long before brains arose. So, so in my group, we, then, we, we, we were thinking about this and we asked this question, okay, if that's, if that's, if that's uh, how, how it works, 
could we make some tools to read and write this electrical information and to really understand how it's navigating that uh, that that shape change space. So we developed the, some of the first tools to um, uh, read and write information into non-brain tissues. So of course these dyes, so these are voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes that uh, report all the electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other. So here's a time lapse of these cells figuring out who's going to be left, right, dorsal, ventral. So, so all of this is, is uh, you're, you're looking at these cells uh, having those conversations. Um, we do a lot of computational modeling to ask, okay, given where the ions are going, how can we predict these voltages? I'm gonna show you um, two patterns. Here's a, here's a time lapse. It's, it happens to be grayscale, but it's the exact same idea. Uh, here's a time lapse of a frog embryo putting its face together. And what you will see, and this is, this is one frame out of that video, what you will see is that this is, uh, this is something we call the electric face discovered by my colleague, Danny Adams. Um, when uh, she was in my group doing this profiling, she found that at, at, at a, here's, here's a particular frame from that, uh, from that video where you can see the, the animal's right eye, the mouth, the, uh, the, the, the placodes, all of this is already demarcated uh, before the genes start to come on and really pattern the face. This is a bioelectric pre-pattern of what the future face is going to look like. And I'm showing you this one because it's so simple. It, it literally looks like a face, right? There are other patterns that are much more complex that you can't really just, you know, sort of visually decode. But this one is very, is very clear. This is the memory of what a uh, tadpole face is going to look like. And if you move this, uh, if, you, if you disrupt this electrical pattern, the gene expression will change and the organogenesis will change. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll show you the show you examples of that momentarily. So, so this is a this is a uh, an endogenous pattern that is required for normal development. In fact, human channelopathies of the that human patients that have craniofacial defects often have mutations in ion channels that that screw up this pattern. Now, that's so that's a normal pattern. Here's a pathological pattern. Uh, we've put in a human oncogene. Uh, these cells will make a tumor, but even before the tumor becomes apparent you can already see this bioelectrical aberrant bioelectrical signature of these cells basically disconnecting from the rest of the tissue and going to their unicellular ancient behavior mode where the rest of the body is just environment as far as they're concerned. So, so, so one, one set of tools is to track these bioelectrical changes. Now here's another important set of tools to actually start to be able to, uh, to write new information into it. And the way we do that, we don't use any applied electric fields. There are no waves, there are no magnets, there's no electromagnetic radiation. What we do is we do exactly what neuroscientists do, which is we um, modify uh, the endogenous mechanisms by which cells establish electrical signals. So either ion channels, we can open them, we can close them, we can uh, use light uh, or drugs to do that. Um, and, and the gap junctions, the, the electrical synapses, so we can determine which cells talk to which other cells by opening and closing these little gap junctions. It's very telling that all of the tools of neuroscience work in other cell types. Basically, the tools can't tell the difference, right? This, this distinction between neuroscience and, and other uh, cells in your body is completely artificial. Um, and it's, you know, it's a consequence of humans trying to parse the world. It's not, um, nature doesn't, doesn't obey that distinction. So what can you do with this? Okay, I've been t talking about these, this electrical information. What, what, what does it actually do? Well, here's, here's a few, here are a few examples. One thing you can do is you can take this, this tadpole and I've shown you the electric face. And so we ask the question, okay, if now, now that we know that there's a particular voltage state that kickstarts eye development, could we simply reproduce that somewhere else? So we took an ion channel RNA that we knew was gonna uh, set the same voltage state. We injected it into precursor cells that are going to give rise to the gut. And sure enough, those cells can form a complete eye. They, uh, the eyes that are formed will have all the right uh, layers, uh, uh, retina, nerve, uh, you know, optic nerve, uh, all that lens, and, uh, and, and, and they can be formed anywhere. They can be formed anywhere, anywhere in the body, as long as the cells get the right pattern that tells them what organ to make. Now, notice two very interesting things here. One is that this instruction is highly modular. We provided a very small piece of information just a voltage pattern. We certainly did not give it all the information needed to specify an eye. Eyes have many cell types. Um, they're very complex. There's no, we, we have no idea how to micromanage the creation of an eye. But what we provided was a, a kind of a subroutine call, a, a signal that says build an eye here, and the cells do. That's the first thing. The second amazing thing is that there are two levels of instruction here. One is us instructing the cells build an eye. But here, what you can see is this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a, of a, of a, of a, sal of a tadpole somewhere. And the blue cells are the ones that carry this ion channel that we put in. But there's not enough of them to make a good lens. So what they've done is recruit their neighbors. 
This is why I, at the very beginning, I pitched this idea that frogolotls might have legs that consist also of, of, uh, of, of frog cells. Why would frog cells build a leg when, uh, when they normally don't? It's because cells have the ability to instruct each other about what to build. And so these cells right here, they, they've been told to make an eye, but there's not enough of them and they know that. And so they, they recruit a bunch of their neighbors, these brown cells that we never touched. There's, they, they're not, these cells are completely wild type. And yet they're participating in making this ectopic lens out in the tail of a, of a tadpole. So, so there's this amazing ability to, to instruct and for the cells to then instruct each other. Now, what else can we make? Well, we can make in the, using the same methodology by manipulating these ion channels. We can make otocysts, which are balanced organs, like inner ear type of organs. We can make uh, complete beating hearts, so, so ectopic hearts. We can make extra forebrain, and then you can, see, you can ask if these animals are any smarter than the, than the normal tadpoles. We can make ectopic limbs, so you can see here uh, all kinds of extra, extra legs that we can form. And we can even make fins. Now, this last one's kind of weird because tadpoles, of course, aren't supposed to have fins. We'll get to that uh, momentarily. Well, what you can see is that by changing the bioelectrical pattern using using manipulation of ion channels, you can tell this collective where to go in morphospace, meaning what types of organs they should be building. You're not micromanaging the specific each step that they take. They figure that out on their own. In fact, we have no idea how to how to do that for any of these complex organs. But you can you can indicate regions about where it is that they should be going. And this has has biomedical implications. So frogs, I told you, unlike salamanders, do not regenerate their legs. So if, if a leg is amputated 45 days later, there's nothing. What we've done is come up with a, a, a drug cocktail that targets ion channels that um, induces leg regeneration. And so you can see here, 45 days later, there's already a nice, uh, a nice leg forming. The leg is touch sensitive, it's motile, it's, it's functional. Um, it has a pretty good, eventually it has a pretty good uh, final, uh, final pattern. And so we're in the process of uh, translating that to mammals. Hopefully this will work. I have to do a disclosure here because this is a commercial venture now. Um, Morphoceuticals Inc. is a, a spinoff between myself and Dave Kaplan where uh, they, the David's lab makes these bioreactors that uh, provide and that have an aqueous environment for the wound. And then we provide the ion channel and other types of uh, payload uh, in there to hopefully um, get leg regeneration in mammals. So this is a, a clinically um, kind of, you know, clinically relevant approach. So um, I want to switch from this now to show you another kind of amazing example of um, what bioelectricity does. Uh, this is these are planaria, so so I've already told you they they have incredible amounts of uh, re uh, regenerative ability. Because of that, they're actually immortal. Um, there's no such thing as an old planarian; they do not age. So um, these animals uh, pretty much go on forever, uh, and uh, and 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 that's because of this incredible ability to continuously replenish and regenerate to keep their keep their pattern um, perfect. So I want to show you I want to show you an example. This is this is a planarian: one head, one tail. You cut off the head and the tail. You got this middle fragment. Uh, we check we check the the gene expression yep anterior genes are in the head no anterior genes in the tail that's fine and 100 percent of the time it makes this normal offspring so so one head one tail okay this it regenerates now here what i'm going to show you is that uh here, here's this here's a planarian one head one tail uh again anterior genes where they're supposed to be but when i cut this guy he makes a two-headed form now i just told you that this process was very reliable why in the world would a one-headed animal uh, make a two-headed uh, and this isn't Photoshop, these are real, you know, real live animals. So, so here, here are heads at both ends. Well, it's because in the meantime, we found that there's an electrical circuit that actually helps this tissue remember how many heads there's supposed to be. And what you can do in the meantime is take this one headed animal and you can look at the electrical pattern. Uh -huh, the electrical pattern says one, one head, one tail. And we can alter that electrical pattern to say, no, you're going to be, you, you, a proper worm should have two heads. Now you can see it's kind of a mess. The technology is still being worked out, but, the, but, but it's very clear. We can, we, can, we can impose this pattern that says two heads. And when you cut that animal, boom, that's what the cells make. Now this is really critical to understand. This bioelectric pattern is not a map of this two-headed guy. This bioelectrical pattern is a map of this one-headed animal into which we incepted a false memory of what planaria are supposed to look like. And they sit there, this memory sits there latent do, doing nothing until you injure them. Once you injure this animal, that is when they will, the cells will pay attention to this pattern and they will go ahead and make a two-headed animal. So if you're wondering where counterfactual, um, where the ability to consider counterfactuals came from, this kind of mental time travel where you can 
consider uh, uh, things and have memories and have predictions about things that are not happening right now. This is perhaps uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, basal uh, precursor of that ability in morphospace. This, this animal has a representation in morphospace of where it will go if it gets injured at a future time. Not what's happening right now. That's not, this is not where I am right now. This is where I'm going to go if I get injured. Now, why do I keep calling this thing a memory? I keep calling it a memory because if you take these two-headed animals and simply recut them again in plain water, no more manipulations of any kind, uh, they will continue to, re to, to rebuild two-headed animals and forever, as far as we can tell. The, the, the question of how many heads a planarian has is not strictly determined by the genome because we didn't touch the genome. The genome is wild type. There's nothing, we, there's no genomic editing here. The, the, that information is sitting in an electric circuit. The default, the genetically set default is one head, but it's easily changed. And in fact, we can now, well, now as I say, it's easy. It took us 10 years to, to, you know, to figure it out, but, it, but in fact, it's, it's quite readily done. And in fact, you can, uh, you can set it back. You can set it back to being one headed by, by again, targeting the information in that electrical circuit. Um, the first time uh, I showed I showed these data, somebody stood up at a conference and said, "Well, the, the, that's impossible. Those animals can't exist." So I, I always bring this video so everybody can see what uh, what the second and third generation of of these guys look like. Uh, so so this this has all the properties of memory. It's long term stable. It's rewritable. It's got a little bit of lability, so it's rewritable. It's got latency or conditional recall. So you can have a single body can have memories of, of what a planarian is supposed to look like that aren't true right now. And it has discrete possible outcomes. So one of the things that we're doing now is, is really trying to integrate models of the physiological state space of, of this animal that where where the circuit the electrical circuit has has a state space where there are attractors that correspond to one heads two heads no heads and so on and merge that with uh models of uh, connectionist uh, artificial neural network uh, type of um, processes where where we already know how to build networks that for example do pattern completion and they have a memory of what the pattern should be and if part of that part of that pattern is missing they can reproduce it and so on this is all this is all part of one problem and and the key is tying it all together in uh, with with these quantitative models that show how this electrical circuit navigates morphospace. space. Now, what I've shown you is that you can tweak that electrical circuit to find an attractor that has two heads instead of one heads. But what else is there? What else does this space actually have? Let's explore that a little bit. Well, the first thing you find is that, well, it contains head shapes of other species. So what you can do is you can take this planarian, cut off the head, uh, perturb the electrical circuit for about 48 hours, then let them let it go. And when it finally settles down into the correct attractor, it doesn't always find the right one. So some percent of the time it goes back to normal and makes this nice triangular head from uh, D. doradocephala. But sometimes it'll make a round head like this S. mediterranea. Sometimes it'll make a flat head like this P. felina. In fact, this is a stochastic process. The frequency of these uh, is proportional to the evolutionary distance between the real, um, um, uh, uh, the real species that are being mimicked here. And again, no changes to the genome. There's nothing genetically wrong with these animals, but you can, you can find these other attractors. And it's not just for head shape. It's the shape of the brain. The distribution of the stem cells become just like these other species. And it's about, they're about 100 to 150 million years distant. Okay, so, so you can find those attractors with the exact same uh, genetics. Uh, in fact, you can find shapes that, uh, don't, that, that, that don't correspond to any real planarian as far as we know. You can make these crazy uh, spiky forms. You can make a different uh, symmetry type. So this kind of cylindrical radial symmetry instead of a flat bilateral symmetry. You can make combinations uh, where, where there's a flatworm with a big tube growing out into the third dimension. And again, nothing wrong with the hardware. There's not, no, no, no mutations. There's nothing wrong with the genome. It's exploring the, it's bioelectrically exploring the space of where it can be. And so the idea is what we're doing now is, is building these, uh, kind of full stack models that, that try to integrate all the way from the molecular information about what channels do you have to work with, so the hardware, all the way up through the physiology of, okay, well, what does this mean for the voltage states across the tissue to, well, what does that mean for the identity of different organs along the primary axis to what kind of algorithm is this whole thing uh, is this whole thing um, uh, implementing such that we could actually understand the algorithm and intervene, right? So, so make make changes. And for this, we have we have uh, all kinds of uh, computational platforms such as such as this, which allows you to load up electrical circuits into cells and then um, simulate simulate tissue and organ level dynamics to understand what the large scale computations are. Okay. 
<clears throat> and so, so just as a simple example, again, of, of, of why this is, why this is useful and what the, what the practical implications of this are, we use this, the strategy to find a, a, a technique for repairing birth defects. So here's a tadpole, here's the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. If it's exposed to nicotine or various other teratogens, you can see there's massive defects. So the, the, the brain is basically gone, um, the forebrain is basically gone, the midbrain and highbrain are damaged. And so what we did is we built this, this bioelectrical model that tries to explain how does the brain know what its size and shape should be. And in cases where, for example, here, this is even worse than a teratogen, we mutated a key neurogenesis gene. This is a gene called Notch. So this gene is mutated. You can see the forebrain is just gone. The midbrain and hindbrain are a bubble. These animals have no behavior. They just lay there doing nothing. It's a very strong defect. What we found, what we did was we asked that model um, which ion channels would we have to open and close to get back to the correct bioelectrical memory of what a, what a correct brain should be? Basically, how do I find my way back in morphospace to what a correct brain should be? And the model made a prediction. We tested that prediction. It happens to be a, a, uh, an already human-approved um, set of uh, drugs that can do this. And sure enough, when we did it, there, there you go. Uh, the, the, uh, their brain structure comes back. Their brain um, gene expression comes back and their IQ comes back. So if you actually test them for their learning rates, they're indistinguishable from controls, even though they've been exposed to teratogens or they have this really nasty genetic defect. Some problems and not all problems, but some problems can be fixed at the level of software. Sometimes when your hardware isn't quite right, you can make up for it in, in software by having a better navigation policy through morphospace. So you're not dead and you're not automatically dead in the water if your hardware is a little wonky. So what that means is, uh, we ought to be able to create these pipelines to uh, to and we, we've already we've already started um, to help design electroceuticals. That is, you, you have some particular problem and you can ask the simulation what type of channel, meaning what drug can I use to get back to my correct bioelectrical pattern? Fundamentally, this is really the, the, the question of how do we exploit this electrical interface that these cells are ex exposing to us, right? Just like neurons do, and people using um, electrodes and optogenetics and everything else to control brains using this electrical interface. We can do exactly the same thing to help guide their navigation through morphospace. It's a, it's a new way of, to think about getting, making drugs for uh, various disorders of, 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 of uh, development, of, of injury and cancer and so on. Okay, so so I want to just just say a couple of things uh, before I wrap up here. I want to say a couple of things about uh, the scaling of cognition in this whole in this whole business, and then show you some some novel synthetic living machines. So the first thing I want to point out is that we've been. I, I started out by saying that thinking about fixed uh, standard animals is is kind of limiting, and that's because the border between self and world is 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 flexible it can change so so again here is a and 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 what what unifies all all of these different kinds of weird intelligences solving problems in morphospace space and in physiological space and so on is their ability to pursue goals meaning to pursue the right region of that morphospace. space so this kind of creature a single cell can have pretty humble little tiny goals right so so on the scale of some number of microns it can it can pursue uh, state physiological states, uh, whole metabolic states, and so on. But these cells can cooperate, and when they co when they cooperate, they can pursue very large goals. So building a limb is a huge goal. No, no individual cell knows what a limb is, or or can count fingers, or anything like that. But the collective sure can. The collective will absolutely pursue this particular region of morphospace despite all kinds of perturbations and when does it stop it stops when it when it reaches that area so when it gets to where it's going and the limb is correct that's when it stops so there's a scaling of goals here now that happens during evolution and as you and you as you'll see in a minute it also can can happen uh, right in front of your eyes but the reverse process we're quite familiar with and that's cancer so these here are glioblastoma cells human glioblastoma cells in culture cells can defect from this uh kind of um from this kind of situation once they electrically isolate from their neighbors then as far as they're concerned they're back to they're back to this scenario the the rest of the body is just external environment to them their their goals are little tiny goals what are the goals of single cell systems well for every cell wants to become two cells and it wants to go wherever life is good and that's metastasis and so that process that's shrinking and growing and in fact uh, these cancer cells are not any more selfish than your normal body cells it's just that the self is smaller 
right? A lot of a lot of work in um, uh, game theory of, of cancer that talks about selfishness and lack of cooperation. They're not any more selfish. It's just that the, the the self towards which they work is just little little tiny. The self is very small. Whereas here, the electrical network is able to bind. And if people want, I have I have all sorts of stories about what exactly happens when they bind together. But I'll skip that for now for, for reasons of time. Um, when when individual cells bind into networks. Those networks have a greater ability to uh, to store memory, to have anticipation of future events, to perceive uh, spatial uh, spatial kinds of uh, signals in their environment, and so the scale grows. And <clears throat> the uh, the biomedical implication of this is that if this were if this were true, you should be able to reverse cancer by artificially reconnecting cells to their neighbors and in fact that's what we've that's what we've done so so when you have this this nasty oncogene you can see that in red it's still here you can prevent the tumor from happening by putting in an ion channel that forces these cells to remain in the right bioelectrical state despite the fact that the oncogene is trying to um, d disassociate them and if you do that the physiology trumps the genetics it will it will these cells will remain even though the oncogene is strongly expressed the cells will remain uh, uh, making nice uh, muscle and skin and whatever else it's, it's supposed to make. So, so this, this, this idea of, of looking at the scaling of the self and the scaling of these goals has real uh, practical uh, implications. And in, in, my, in my model, one of the things that um, it allows the framework to do is to compare directly very diverse intelligences. So any intelligence, be it evolved, designed, uh, some sort of hybrid, some sort of alien thing, or maybe soft, pure software, it doesn't matter, any agent has a set of, that, that can pursue goals, you can simply plot the size of those goals. So, so how big are they in space and time, right? You might have, you might have a tick that only cares about local butyrate concentration, and that's all that it's ever going to care about. And so it has a tiny little um, cognitive light cone that allows it to pursue these tiny little goals. And you, or you might have a dog, which has a bigger cognitive light cone and has some pretty good memory going backwards, has a little bit of anticipation potential forwards, it's never going to care about what happens two towns over three months from now. It's impossible that its goal space is simply not that big, right? And then you can have humans, which uniquely perhaps have uh, have a cognitive light cone that's bigger than their own lifespan. So the the human can comprehend and pursue goals that are that are guaranteed not achievable in your lifetime. And that, for all I know, that may drive some interesting psychological pressures that uh, that humans face. But this idea that that we are all made of a of a collective of agents. Each of these agents is solving problems in its own space, and within that space, there are differently scaled goals. Some, some very, very, you know, very modest, and some, some, some massive. You know, some humans are working for world peace, and 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 you know, these kinds of very complex, very large, long-term things. So the idea is that in this multi-scale system, what happens is that higher levels bend the option space for their subunits. So. So, so in uh, if 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 you've got a morphogenetic space that that uh, that it, that has attractors for different head shapes, that's because those those bioelectrical states distort the the space of gene expression for their cells, such that all the cells need to do is go down their concentration gradients the way they normally do. They don't have to know where they're going, but in fact, they end up at a very particular uh, morphological um, outcome because because the higher level has already distorted that space, and so. There are all kinds of interesting work to be done looking at mathematical formalisms from relativity theory and, and, and from some other um, disciplines to look at how, at how that works. And in fact, all that's happening here is the scaling up of goals. So once you have a single cell that can do this cycle, this, this test measure act, uh, test compare act kind of cycle, let's say, for example, for keeping pH, once you start connecting cells into electrical networks, now everything scales up. Their goals are bigger. Their memories are bigger. The the ability to act are bigger. This is what evolution is 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 doing. It's constantly scaling up these these homeostatic units, and it's actually uh, pivoting them through different spaces. So very simple kinds of organisms. Uh, all they could do is traverse metabolic space to keep alive. But eventually that works up to physiological spaces, then gene expression becomes a thing. And so they can work in transcriptional spaces, then multi, uh, the complex anatomy, so, so morpha space. And eventually when brains and muscles show up, you're in behavioral space and who knows what other spaces there are linguistically and there may be many others. So just to close off in the last few minutes, um, I want to uh, I want to show you an example of novelty. Uh, so I've been I've been talking about intelligence and the idea that um, these uh, all of these different uh, different systems are able to handle novel conditions. I want to show you an extreme example of that. So 
this is uh, this is work that uh, Joshua Bongard's lab and and we are doing in uh, in in this new institute. And we wanted to ask a simple question, uh, well, a set of questions. One is how much how much real time plasticity really is there? I mean, we've seen that you can get you can get pretty far away from the genomic default, but what what else can these cells do? And in fact. When we look at development, normal development, to what extent is it is it fooling us? To what extent are we basically lulled into thinking that because acorns make oak trees and frog eggs make make frogs, to what extent are we really fooled into thinking that that's basically all that they can do? And so we started asking about you know what what might the default competencies of some of these cells and tissues be? Okay, and so so what we did was 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 this simple experiment. I'm just going to uh, pause. Oops, I'm going to pause this here. What we did was uh, a simple experiment where, um, and this all the biology was done by uh, Doug Blackiston um, in my group and the, and the computer science you're about to see was done by uh, Sam Kriegman. Um, what we did was we took some skin cells off of a frog embryo and we put those skin cells by themselves in a dish. So we didn't add anything. There are no nanomaterials. There are no genetic circuits being added. There are no weird transgenes or chemicals. What we do is subtract. What do we subtract? We subtract all this other stuff. We subtract all their normal neighbors that are normally uh, instructing these cells as to what to do, and we give them a chance to reboot their multicellularity. Now, there's all sorts of things they could do. So, so they could just go and die. They could spread out and get away from each other. They could form a flat two-dimensional two, uh, monolayer the way that cell culture does. There are many things that, that could happen. And so, so here's what happens. We, um, we dissociate these cells. We put them in this little, little depression. Well, overnight, they sort of come together like this, and then they form this little round ball. This, the, the flashes you're seeing is calcium signaling. So it's a calcium sensitive dye. It, um, you, they, they, they start to sort of signal to each other. And what they form is something we call xenobots. Now, why xenobots? Because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog and, uh, and it's a bio robotics platform. So the way, it's, the way they're, they're swimming is they have little hairs on their surface. These hairs called cilia are normally used to redistribute mucus on the, across the body of the frog. Here, what they've done is they've sort of they've learned to row, and so and so the cells, uh, the the cilia are moving, and this thing is propelling itself. They can go in circles, they can go straight back and forth like this. Uh, here you can see a bunch of them in their various. Uh, this is just tracking data. So so these two are interacting. These are sitting there doing nothing. This one's going on kind of a longer journey. Um, here here's one navigating a, a maze. This is still water. There's no water movement in here. So it moves along. It takes the corn without bumping into the opposite wall, and then at some point, for reasons that nobody uh, nobody can predict yet, uh, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. So it it again goes along, does not need to bump into anything to know that it could take a corner here, and then at this point, mm, turns around, turns around and goes and, and goes back. Okay. Now, um, one of the things you can see with this calcium signaling is that they're very active. This looks very brain-like. This looks very similar to that zebrafish kind of signaling that, that I showed you before, except there's no neurons here. This is just skin. Everything that you just saw was 100% skin cells. There's no, there's no brain here, there's no nervous system. And so not only, uh, you know, so, so who knows, we're, we're still ex experimenting with like, what, what might they be saying to each other when they're, when they're doing this? But, but one thing you, could, you can see, they, they do a couple of interesting things. One thing they can do is regenerate. So here's, here's one that was basically cut in half. And now think about think about the force. Look at that hinge as it as it uh, folds up. Think about the the force that it takes to 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 clamp something shut from a 180 degree position. But it basically folds up, right, to be um back to its uh, to its xenobot shape. And one of the things we started thinking about is how can we how can we predict what this kind of system is going to do? I mean, nobody knew what what they were going to do. So so Josh Bongard's lab started um, modeling their their behavior in this kind of simulation. The simulation can actually tell you what the behavior of different shaped bots is going to be. And then you can go ahead and micro sculpt them or do various things. And you can see the patterns that uh, this is just uh, carmine powder on the bottom of the dish. And these guys sweep it along as they go. So you can see all the cool patterns that they make as they're um, navigating. But but here's something here's something interesting. If you if you um, simulate them in, in an environment with a bunch of loose bricks, what you see is that they tend to they tend to collect them into little piles. And so what what might be the significance of that? Well, it turns out the real bots do exactly that. And if you provide them, so these are Xenobots provided with a bunch of loose uh, skin cells. So these white dots are just loose skin cells hanging around. And what you'll see is that these the, the, the Xenobots will run around, they will collect either together or individually, they'll make little piles. 
And because this is an agential material, right? These cells are not passive. They, once the cells are collected into a pile, what do they make? They make xenobots. So this is kinematic self-replication. These bots make copies of themselves from the loose material in the dish. We've made it impossible for them to uh, replicate the way that normally frogs reproduce, so they can't do that. But within 48 hours, they show us that there's another way to do this that, as far as we know, no other animal uses. It's basically von Neumann's dream, which is uh, machines that will go out and build copies of themselves from parts that they find laying around. That's what's going on here. These xenobots build the next generation of xenobots out of these loose cells. When those mature, guess what they do? They run around, do exactly the same thing. You get the next generation and then the next generation after that. Now, <clears throat> there's no strong heredity here yet, um, as far as we know. But, uh, and, and the reason it works here is really critical. The reason it works is the exact same reason that we were able to make xenobots in the first place, because these cells are not passive Legos. They are an agential material that once they get together in a particular group, they know what to do. They, they have an innate preference to, to make bots. That's, that's why these bots are able to make new bots. So uh, here's, the, uh, here's kind of the amazing thing about it is that um, same genome, so if you were to sequence a xenobot, all you would ever see is the Xenopus lavus genome. You'd have no idea that it was any different. That same genome can do at least two different uh, life histories. It can do this, so, so normal, normal Xenopus um, uh, uh, stages and then normal tadpole behavior, or it can do this. So here's an early xenobot. Here's a xenobot at about two months. It's, it has a developmental sequence. It's turning into something. What is that? I have no idea what that is. There's never been, there's never been any xenobots before, so it's some kind of novel uh, no, novel uh, developmental stage, and eventually they, they have these, these kinds of behaviors. So we're still working out. We, we don't know how much cognition they actually have. Can they, do, can they learn? Can they, uh, do they have preferences? What do they react to? We, we don't know. We're still figuring that out. But the amazing thing about it is that uh, for, for, for most animals, the way they navigate both physical and anatomical space, you, when you ask, you know, why do they have a certain number of legs, a certain color, certain behaviors, it's all, the answer is always, well, because for millions of years, the ancestors were selected for this or that, and everybody else died off, and now this is what you have. Well, there's never been any xenobots, and there's never been selection to be a good xenobot. All of this is created on the fly. This is, this is what they do. They create a coherent organism. And by the way, if you ask, what do skin cells normally want to do? You might think that well, what they normally want to do is to be this like passive two-dimensional layer on the outside of an animal to keep out the bacteria. That isn't what they want to do. What, that's what they're bullied into doing by the instructive interactions with the rest of the cells. If you don't have those cells, this is what they're actually, this is their default, this is actually their default behavior. So what evolution does is what bioengineers can and will be doing is behavior shaping. It's figuring out signals to get your agential material, not passive, not a blank slate, but your agential material to do whatever you want it to do. So I'm just going to um, close up here with with a couple of uh, thoughts. This is uh, this is just a, a kind of a, a an overview of this of this framework that that we've been working on. This kind of um, continuum of agency across very diverse uh, implementations. The idea of of, of scaling of the boundaries of goals for any particular system as a way to compare radically different types of intelligences in different spaces. Um, bioelectricity is a, is a particular example. It's not the only one. I'm sure there are other ways to tell this story, but bioelectricity is a really great way to look at what is the, uh, what is the cognitive medium of a collective intelligence, and it seems to be electricity in, in many cases. Um, and there are all kinds of implications for, for evolution, including asking questions about where do these goals come from? If it's not just selection, wh where in fact do they come from? And so just to finish up, I want to point out that one of the consequences of the fact that biology can solve problems on the fly and that it's incredibly interoperable is that pretty much any combination of evolved material, meaning cells or tissues or genes, design materials, so smart uh, nanomaterials, uh, all kinds of uh, constructs, and, and uh, software, any combination of these is some viable creature. And so when Darwin said endless forms most beautiful, impressed, being, being impressed with a variety of biology that he was seeing around, that's just all of that, everything on earth is a tiny corner of this incredibly huge option space, which we're already beginning to explore. So there are already cyborgs, you know, humans with various implants, both sensory and, um, and effectors. People can run wheelchairs with their minds and have, have all kinds of uh, sensors attached to them. Uh, hybrids, which are brains uh, driving vehicles instead of biological bodies. Um, we, people started a long time ago making, making chimeras, so, so mules, right? Horses and donkeys make mules, so, so you can start to mix genetic material. After that, people would make grafts in plants and, may, and mix uh, at the cellular level. 
every combination. We, we are going to be living in a world where we are surrounded by agents that don't look like anything familiar on the phylogenetic tree. And this means that we have massive uh, implications for systems of ethics because the old uh, traditional framework where you look at something and you ask, where did it come from? Would it come from a factory or was it, was it natural? And what does it look like? Does it look like a fish, an ape or a human or, a, you know, or, or something else? Those kinds of uh, touchstones are going to be completely useless in uh, deciding how to relate to these beings that are going to be around us in terms of what do we owe them, what do uh, what what can we expect of them, all, all of these things. We we can we're not going to be able to rely on familiar categories of where did it come from and how much like a like a human does it you know does it look. That's going to be gone. So that's, those things will not survive the next few decades. So we are going to need to develop novel frameworks because life is so good at navigating these spaces that all of these things are going to be viable. So I'll just close by saying that um, all of this is, is discussed in great detail in various papers. Anybody uh, just please email me and I'll send you everything. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the various uh, intelligent beings that uh, contributed to all the work I showed you. So all of our postdocs, uh, PhD students, um, the model systems that we work with, they do all the heavy lifting, all the, all the slime molds and the, the planaria and the tap holes and everything else. And of course, our, our funders, and again, uh, dis two disclosures. So Morphoceuticals is a company around uh, limb regeneration and Fauna Systems is a company for um, Xenobots. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for listening.